Okay, ready? Let's talk about some human nutrition. Okay, so you were awake last night until 2.30 a.m. finishing a class project. Unfortunately, your Psych 101 class meets at 9 a.m. this morning. When your alarm goes off at 7.30 a.m., you decide to sleep those extra 20 minutes it would take to sit down and enjoy breakfast at your table. What's your best time-saving breakfast option? A, skip breakfast but plan to consume a few extra calories at lunch and dinner. B, eat a low-fat granola bar and some iced coffee from the vending machine at school. C, eat a quick bowl of Wheaties with a banana, low-fat milk, along with a yogurt, all from your pantry. D, pick up a ham and egg, sam ham, egg and cheese bagel along the way with coffee. And in the coffee, it has heavy whipping cream. Uh. All right, so here we go. How many of you are going to answer A? Be honest, what would you probably do? Okay, skip breakfast. All right, there's a lot of breakfast skippers, okay? How many of you are going to eat the low-fat granola bar and iced coffee from the vending machine? Nobody? No, probably, it's gross. I'd probably just skip. Uh, C, eat those Wheaties with your banana, low-fat yogurt, all from your pantry. Yeah? Okay. Sounds disgusting, but all right. Uh, pick up a ham, egg, and cheese bagel with coffee. Oh, yeah, that would be me. <laughs> like that, and with the heavy whipping cream. I don't drink coffee without that stuff. That's great. All right, so we're going to talk about why one might be better than another and why, for some people, one might be better than another. Because remember, one of the things you need to know is that kind of sort of the way we've all grown up and learned about nutrition is uh, one size fits all. And everybody should be doing the same thing and everything is good for everybody. And you know, that doesn't really work for a lot of things and for nutrition, uh, that doesn't really work all that well either. Okay, so some people are going to do better on one kind of diet than uh, another type of diet. And you know, uh, as much as we're in America and everybody's equal and all that kind of stuff, eh, not really, okay? Uh, especially when it comes to nutrition because a lot of it has to do with our genetics and our kind of background. And I'm sorry, uh, you know, did our parents cook a certain way? Did we learn to eat a certain way? We have much more likelihood of how we're going to eat uh, depending on what our mom cooked for us. And so some diets are going to be a little bit easier to stick to for some people and you're going to have to try to keep that as healthy as you possibly can for that patient in comparison to other diets. It may not be so easy. And you know, uh, I'm a little white girl, okay? Uh, I think you could probably tell that, right? And I come with those genetics, okay? And one of the things in my background is that I'm Irish. And I can tell you right now, the Irish have had a long history of famine. And because they've had a long history of famine, hundreds of years over and over and over again famines have happened, genetics have changed. And one of the things about Irish people is because they've had so many famines, uh, their genetics are, you can't eat much. If you consume too many calories, because see, we're made to outlast famines. Okay? And if we consume too many calories, you're going to get sick and you're going to get fat. And somebody else might be able to eat 2,000, 3,000 calories a day and be okay. If I did that, I'd weigh 500 pounds. I can't consume that many calories in a day. I wish I could, but <laughs> it just doesn't work. So you have to understand that nutrition really has a lot of different components to it instead of just, hey, everybody needs to eat this way and we're okay. And even though that's kind of how our government and our schools teach us that this one size nutrition fits all is not really the case. And scientifically, we're going to try to talk about how science has shown that's not really the case either. Okay, so. Again, what's going to influence the choice of the foods that we eat, okay? Now, keep in mind, you can download these PowerPoints, so you don't have to, like, take a ton of notes from the PowerPoints, okay? Um, and a lot of it has to do, we're going to eat with uh, what we enjoy, okay? What tastes good to us, 
And you know, everything doesn't taste good to everybody. Some people like certain things, some other people like other things. And then there's your gender, okay? So it's real interesting. They did um, quite a few studies on what women like to eat versus what men like to eat. And what we like to eat has a lot to do with our sex hormones. So the higher your levels of testosterone, the greater the chance that you like to eat, especially for snacks, okay, fatty, salty foods. The greater your levels of estrogen, the more likely you are to eat sweets. So if you go into, you know, the store with, if you're female, you go in with a male, uh, the male is typically going to go to the chips, that kind of thing, and the girl is going to go to the candy and cookies. That's really quite typical. So our genetics uh, and our hormones have a lot to do with what it is we like to eat. So ladies, you probably know there's typically a few more cravings for that chocolate stuff right around that menstrual time. And gentlemen, you probably want to have it ready to keep her happy, okay? Just, <laughs> just saying, okay? Uh, texture, a lot of people are real texture people. They won't eat certain foods because of the way it feels, okay? And the theory that food habits are hard to change is really true, okay? So again, how your mom cooked for you, okay? If she was the major person to cook or maybe your dad cooked for you. Uh, then those food habits are really ingrained. Well, that looks yummy. Can you sit in the back? Or... Sitting here and listen to me? Oh, I don't know about that. Okay. <laughs> Critique you. Critique me. There you go. Uh, we talked about culture and environment. So uh, that has a lot to do with it. Like, for instance, are you uh, eating with a bunch of friends? Okay. Now, what did they say? It was you eat 40% more? If you're eating with friends? Yeah, so at any meal, you're more likely to eat 40% more calories than you would if you were eating by yourself. Because, well, you're having a good time. So what's that extra ice cream, you know, or that, you know, banana split that you would normally eat among friends? And then you can make the excuse, oh, well, I'll just share it with your friends. And so we have a tendency to eat more because of uh, a good social life. Uh, and then there's a real issue that you're going to find with people. They have very little knowledge of nutrition. Okay? Uh, and a lot of people will say, well, you know, I just thought it was good for me. I thought this was all okay. And uh, I had no idea that they would be serving something that wasn't nutritious. Uh, very few people read labels. Okay? Uh, and then even if you do read labels, there's a lot of chemicals on there that we don't know what the crud those things are. And on top of that, they don't have to tell us. The government has given these food companies permission to have all these top secret types of foods uh, or chemicals in our food, and we're not even allowed to know what those chemicals are. Or they package it in plastic, but it's not And advertising, I don't know about you, but that might sway me to buy something. Uh, we spend about $15 billion uh, every year on food advertising. And $700 million is marketing breakfast cereals, candy, and gum. Now, why in the world do we spend um, over half a billion dollars on breakfast cereals, candy, and gum? Kids, yeah, we want to influence kids. Because you know if that kid whines enough, you're going to get it for them. And uh, so we want them to be able to influence their parents. Uh, $500 million is spent on soft drinks. Uh, there was a recent study that just came in, and uh, it came to the conclusion that the average American drinks 20 gallons of soda a year. Wow. That is a lot of soda. Oh, and by the way... That's lower this year than last year. So Americans are kind of wising up about soda not being so good for you, but we're still drinking quite a bit. They say uh, about 15 years ago, the average American drank about 75 gallons of soda a year. So down to 20 over that time is pretty amazing. So we're, we're doing a good job cutting that all out. Um, 
So food advertisements are very effective, especially the younger the person. Uh, they will view, your kids will view about 40,000 television commercials annually uh, that has to do with food. That's why I got that, uh, what is it that we have where you can fast forward through commercials? Uh, yeah, there you go. I don't even know what it's called, but I don't have commercials anymore because I can't stand them. Uh, I don't know if you're old enough to remember the Got Milk campaign, but that was the most successful advertising campaign in history. And, uh, well, they because they use people that look like that all over the <laughs> campaign. And the ladies were just as good looking, so uh, people paid attention and drank more milk. Although now our milk consumption in the United States has fallen so dramatically that our dairy farmers are going out of business and um, it, it is time to be concerned. We've lost so many dairy farmers, you may not have milk or cheese products if it keeps going. So we might need to bring the Got Milk campaign back. <laughs> All right, so time is also really important when we're talking about nutrition. Okay, so mom's gone to work, dad's at work, what the heck are you supposed to eat? Mom's tired by the time she comes home, she doesn't want to cook, okay? And so what are you going to do? Well, you're going to have fast food, or you're going to order that pizza and have it delivered on the way home. Uh, the working mom now spends less than 30 minutes making a meal, and that includes cleanup. So I'm going to guess there's a lot of microwaving going on. Uh, I can remember when I was a kid, my mom stayed home, and I remember her starting meals early in the morning and cooking all day long. Of course, you can't get meals like that anymore, so, <laughs> and they were good. Uh, processed foods, okay, we're going to talk a lot about what these foods are uh, and how are they nutritious or not nutritious, what's going on when we microwave those. But between 1970 and 2016, 30% of the household budget was spent on eating out. Now it's 50% of the household budget is spent on eating out. That's a lot of money. And most of that is fast food. So imagine somebody's making, I don't know, $3,000 a month, and 1,500 of those dollars are spent on eating out. So when people say to me, oh, well, you know, eating well is too expensive, I say, well, you know, if you stop eating at that McDonald's, even though you think it's the dollar menu, it is actually more expensive than making your own food. And especially if you're not making your food from processed foods and you're making it from natural food. It goes a lot further as far as a meal is concerned and you don't spend as nearly as much money. Hmm. Oh, let me go back to that. Uh, research suggests that low-cost, high-calorie diets such as lots of burgers, fries, tacos, soft drinks increases our risk of obesity and it is really in our lower socioeconomic people because we are telling them this is the cheaper way to eat, and really it's not. Okay, so your habits are very important, and it's really hard to start a habit, okay? Uh, and, but you, a lot of times, don't even realize you're starting habits. You know, you get up in the morning, and you start doing the same routine over and over again, and does that include making breakfast? Does it include time for lunch? or time for dinner, do, are you remembering, like me, do you remember to pick up your lunch out of the refrigerator before you leave? And if you don't, then you get fast food, okay? And that's not necessarily the right thing to be doing. And uh, make sure you have the right snacks as well. And then of course, you know, we're all human, so if you're bored, and it's especially with boredom, we have a tendency to like to munch and crunch more. Uh, and where most of us Americans are eating the majority of our calories is in our car. So going from point A to point B, we're munching a lot of calories, and a lot of those are fast food calories or chips or whatever it is. Now, why are we doing this? Well, the major reason is because these types of foods are actually designed to increase certain neurotransmitters. So don't think that these food companies don't know this. They have a whole bunch of physiologists working for them, 
a lot of different scientists trying to figure out what chemicals can I put into this food that legally I can use to number one, addict them to my food, and number two, make them emotionally attached to my food. So we have certain neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine that are able to stimulate our brain. And when these chemicals stimulate our brain, we feel good. We call these the feel-good neurotransmitters. They make us happy. They make us feel relaxed. They just make us feel good overall. And so these food companies add certain things or make sure there's just enough sugar or just enough salt, just enough fats in a food, certain combinations, and they do all kinds of testing on rats and other animals and even on people to make sure they get the response from the foods that they want. And they get those feel-good responses to make sure that you keep coming back for more and more and more. And why not? That's the way they make their money. It's kind of scary to know how much they're doing all this stuff to get us. Uh, these are the three most commonly purchased foods in America. Milk, soft drinks, and bread. Yep. It's interesting. Now, although milk is on the decline, we don't buy as much milk anymore. So the major drives are hunger and appetite, obviously. And that's our biological drive. Now, you know that in our brain, we have an area called the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus has what's referred to as the hunger satiety center. Okay? And so in this region of our brain, in the hypothalamus, this hunger satiety center controls whether we perceive ourselves as being hungry or we perceive ourselves as being full. And certain chemicals that enter our bloodstream can affect that hunger satiety center. Like for instance, fat in our diet, when we eat fatty foods, it has the ability to stimulate that satiety center and let us know we feel full and we feel full for a longer period of time. So as you're doing your little food journals over the next few weeks, look to see what a fatty meal actually does for you. Does that fatty meal typically keep you fuller longer? And I'm gonna guess the answer is yes to that. Whereas a meal that is more filled with sugar uh, doesn't keep us feeling very full very long and we want more pretty quickly because it doesn't stimulate the satiety center quite as nicely as maybe a fatty meal does. So appetite, okay, is more what we would call our psychological drive. So that's what we've been talking about, like your environment, your customs, uh, being out with your friends, how much appetite, how much do you feel like eating. Okay, so as we're going through some of the questions of human nutrition, what are the essential nutrients in the diet for normal functioning of the body? We're going to talk about that. How do they work in the body and from which foods can we obtain each of them? And then can we delay or even prevent chronic degenerative diseases by modifying what we usually eat? This is really kind of a synopsis of this class and that's really what nutritionists are trying to do is to figure out what's good for us and then is it good for us, it, does it prevent certain diseases or at least keep us from getting them uh, too early in life. So what is nutrition and this is really the study of the different types of compounds, molecules found in food and how does that nourish our body, how does that help our overall health, okay? So that's what we're looking at. Dietitians, okay, so some of you may uh, be looking into becoming a dietitian, and these are people that uh, get degrees in nutrition and in dietetics, and they help uh, in hospital settings 
to modify the patient's diets to help them to overcome diseases or to what we call ameliorate or make the disease less, the person becomes more healthy, that type of thing. So when we're talking about nutrients, these are the actual compounds in the food that help to sustain our body, give us energy, keep our cells alive, make sure we have all the right building blocks like proteins and fat so that our body can perform the functions that it needs to perform. Any questions, by the way? If you have a question along the way, feel free to pop your hand up and ask. So essential nutrients are the chemicals or the substances found in food that we can't make. Okay, so we'll talk about essential versus non-essential. There are some substances that our body actually has the ability to turn into certain nutrients. But there are essential nutrients, and we can't synthesize these in our body. We actually have to eat certain amounts to keep the body going. So we'll talk about what uh, different types of essential nutrients and non-essential as we go along. So a lot of today is just kind of talking about definitions and what nutrition is and all that kind of good stuff. And then we'll get into more uh, specifics next time. So why study nutrition? Why take a class like this? And really the bottom line is if you're going into the medical field, you already know that the way we eat uh, can be fatal. Okay, if all I'm eating is chocolate every day for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, the likelihood of me getting diabetes is like, it's going to be there, okay, and I'm going to kill myself. And on top of it, I'm going to be a tired, run down, not happy person. Uh, and so we need to talk about some of the different uh, ideas now out there in nutrition that doesn't necessarily go along with what our government is going to say about nutrition, okay? Uh, and you'll see even if you're reading the textbook as you go along, uh, even our textbooks now are changing what we've known about nutrition or what we thought we knew because there's a lot of different science out there now uh, trying to study nutrition, which is kind of cool because there hasn't been a lot of science of nutrition. But because people are so sick, because of the foods that we've been eating, there are more and more studies on nutrition, which is really kind of nice, at least for all of us. And then, of course, uh, there's a lot more obesity uh, in the United States, actually a lot more obesity around the world than there was before. And the question is, how is this happening? Where you're seeing many, many countries that have obesity issues. And of course, that's going to lead to all kinds of disease, okay? So we see a lot of food preventable diseases occurring. And so how are we able to prevent that? Now, of course, one of the major causes of disease in the United States is smoking, okay? And so one of the questions for that is, um, we don't outlaw smoking, and then we make it legal for them to smoke marijuana. And medically speaking, all you're going to see is more disease. Because when cigarettes came into vogue, everybody smoked more. And now we already know that since we have no longer outlawed marijuana, one of the huge issues is everybody smoking more. And they just came out with a, a short study that they did in the state of Colorado, which is the first state to legalize smoking of marijuana. And now what they're finding is it's not necessarily that more people are smoking marijuana, although the population has risen. It's the people that were smoking it before are smoking far more than they did before. And now these people are becoming extremely ill. And so uh, their emergency rooms are now seeing many, many more cases of overconsumption of this drug and all of the things that it's doing to the body. So it's going to be cool for science because there's going to be a lot of scientific studies now. Not cool for the people who are doing it because we're going to see a lot more people sick from this, which is really unfortunate. But the number two preventable cause of death in the United States is <coughs> obesity. And so we're going to talk about how can we uh, do something different for our patients. 
So what are the classes and sources of nutrients? We're going to go over all of these. So I just want to let you know, next time we'll talk about carbohydrates, then we'll talk about fats and proteins. And then we're going to talk about vitamins and minerals and water, but we're going to kind of do it a different way because we're going to talk about things like all of the different things that are healthy for your immune system and incorporate it that way. All of the things that are healthy for your muscles and bones incorporate it that way. So we're going to kind of break it down into uh, different ways to look at it, not just look at it. Here's all the vitamins. Here's all the minerals. That's sort of boring. Okay, so there are some what we would call non-nutrients found in food, and uh, these are called uh, phytochemicals, and these are foods from plant sources like fruits and vegetables. Uh, these do not necessarily um, help with making energy in the body or help our body to build things like proteins, but we know that these phytochemicals can provide things like antioxidants. We know to some degree antioxidants can slow down the growth of certain cancer cells. Uh, it used to be thought if you uh, consume enough antioxidants you'll never get cancer. That's absolutely not true. But there are certain natural antioxidants, like if you not you take the pill where they made it from strawberries or blueberries, but if you actually eat the fruit, those antioxidants in their natural state can slow down the growth of some types of cancer cells. So when they talk about antioxidants in this vitamin or whatever it is, um, it's not really suggested nutrient-wise. Uh, they're, they're not very well tested, uh, and so it's much more suggested just eat it in the food to get the greatest amount of health. Uh, there are some types of foods also that uh, people like to refer to as like superfoods, and these are foods that are super high levels of phytochemicals. Uh, for instance, like a superfood is a tomato, which is kind of interesting. Not a lot of people like tomatoes, but they are actually considered a superfood because they have a lot of different antioxidants in it. I don't really care for them, but okay. Um, strawberries are actually a type of superfood, so I'm good with that. Especially if you can dip it in some whipped up <laughs> cream. No sugar at all, but it's really good. Uh, another superfood? Spinach. Spinach. There you go. Of course, um, best not to eat it like Popeye did in the can. Uh, best to actually eat it raw, not cooked. If you're going to cook your spinach and you want your phytochemicals from spinach, drink the water because it's all in the water. By the way, when you boil your vegetables, all of the nutrients are now in the water. Yeah. If you buy those canned vegetables, all of the nutrients are in the water. So throw those vegetables away and drink the water. <laughs> <laughs> That's the really good part for you. What so, about when you I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, what about when you steam them? When you steam them? No, it stays in the vegetable if you steam them. Okay. okay. Well, most of it, yes. You, you still, you could still some of it. drink the water. Uh, so here are some <laughs> of the different uh, phytochemicals, like in spinach, uh, there's lutein and lycopene, anthocyanins. These are just examples of phytochemicals. Uh, th by the way, those anthocyanins, this is really cool. Um, they also, when you make wine from those dark purple grapes, the anthocyanins are in the wine, so oh. forget the grapes, drink the wine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> and I'm not expecting you to memorize these, but you've probably heard of things like uh, beta carotene, okay? Yeah. Uh, but there's also things like uh, saponins and curcum. These are all reservatrol, okay? That's also in your wine. And that's really good for you. It helps keep your skin young. Okay, so drink more wine. <laughs> There are some other chemicals, and got, of course these are also those non-nutrients, these are called zoochemicals, uh, and these are found in animal foods. Okay, so if you're eating meat, meat do have uh, antioxidant properties also. So, and this is kind of against what you might hear, you know, again from the government, don't eat your red meat, it's bad for you, it causes cancer, but actually red meat is very high in antioxidants. So here's the issue with red meat. It's not the meat itself. It's the nitrates that they put in the meat as a preservative that has been shown to cause cancer. Mm -hmm. And that's why when you go to the store, your meat actually looks red. 
Yeah. Okay. So you saw my little cow. Um, well, we slaughtered her brother not too long ago. Oh. <laughs> okay. So I have a farm. We eat okay. our animals on the farm. All right. And uh, her brother, his name was Fergus. And we give homage to him every time we eat him. Thank you, Fergus, for all that you have done for us. But none of his meat is red. We don't have red meat in our freezer, even though it's a cow. Our meat is brown. That's the color it's supposed to be in its natural state because we don't put any nitrites or nitrates in it. And so in order to get you to think that that meat is nice and healthy and really good, they dye it. And they put all these preservatives in it to keep that dye really red. And those, we know, cause cancer. Is that why when sometimes, like, if you go and defrost your meat, all the blood, the, and then it turns brown? It has the brown look, yes. Yeah. That's right. Uh, the eggs also have types of antioxidants in it. Uh, and here's the other thing, too. There's a disease called macular degeneration. And uh, this... For those of you who may not know this, this is genetic. So if you have somebody in your family who has had macular degeneration, like a grandparent or your parents, you have a high likelihood of getting this. However, egg yolks have zoochemicals that decrease the likelihood of you getting macular de degeneration or even cataracts. So the macula is found in the back of your eye. And it is part of what we call the retina of your eye, helps you to, to see. If your macula degenerates, you're going to go blind. Okay, so you just won't be able to see anymore. So if this runs in your family and you don't want to go blind, you should probably have some egg yolks every once in a while. Make yourself an omelet and keep your eyesight. It also helps to keep the cornea, the outer layer of your eye, more healthy and less susceptible to UV light and UV light can wear that cornea away, and if it gets worn away, you get cataracts, and you can also go blind. So, uh, problem for me is macular degeneration runs in my family, and I'm allergic to eggs. Sucks, man. <laughs> so you just have to watch it close. Now, here's the other cool thing. If it does run in your family, you always want to make sure you're going to the optometrist and having them check your eye, because there are now, so, what will happen is when they look into your eye, they can see that the macula of your eye is bleeding. And so that bleeding is the beginning of the degeneration. Well, there are shots that you can get that will stop that bleeding. The only bad thing is you've got to get the shot right through your eye. Oh. It's kind of freaky. My mother's had to have this done. So uh, she was freaking out. And I said, don't worry about it. You won't even see it coming because they dilate your pupil. And they dilate it so big that so much light is coming in your eye, it's just like you're blind. So they take the needle and then they put it right through the center of your eye all the way to the back of your eye. It's a long needle. They get it to the back of your eye and then they push the medicine in there that basically stops the bleeding. It clots the blood. And uh, you don't feel it because they also numb your eye so you don't feel anything. And they did all these shots within seconds. And uh, unfortunately, she didn't know that this ran in the family and so she has some very severe blindness issues now. However, omega-3 fatty acids can also help with macular degeneration, and they also um, help to clean out your arteries. So this chemical, this omega-3 fatty acid, we're going to talk about this a lot more. These are found in natural animal products, and they help to dissolve what we call plaque in your arteries. So those things that harden your arteries and clog your arteries, these types of chemicals help to take those out of the arteries. And just some examples of where you would find these in animal products would be like butter. And then, of course, eggs. And certain types of fish will have a lot of omega-3 fatty acids in it. So we'll talk about these more as we go along. Um, there are some interesting nutrients that we can make in our body as long as uh, we have sunlight. And one of those is vitamin D. So we're going to talk about vitamin D a lot more. But we, in our body, in our kidneys, make a chemical that can turn into vitamin D. But that chemical, once it's made from the kidneys, it gets underneath the surface of your skin. And when the sun shines on your skin, 
it turns into vitamin D. Now here's one of the issues though. If you've got really dark skin, it has a hard time converting that chemical to vitamin D. So people with very, very dark colored skin may have some vitamin D deficiencies. Also, if you don't get out in the sun very much, you have to be out in the sun at least 30 minutes a day exposing your arms and your legs to get enough vitamin D. Okay? I take vitamin D every day because I'm never out in the sun. I'm always in this freaking classroom. Okay? So most of us in the high desert are going to be vitamin D deficient because it's either way too hot to be standing outside in the sun or on other times of the year it's way too cold to be standing outside. So we have a lot of vitamin D deficiencies in the high desert. Is it true that redheads make their own vitamin D? They don't need to go out in the sun? Absolutely not true. I'm nope, sorry. I read that somewhere. Nope. Nope. They, they have to have vitamin D sunlight yeah. as well. Now we can get some vitamin D from some of the foods that we eat, uh, and of course you can get it in vitamin pill form, uh, but mostly it uh, should be, in order to have an adequate amount, should be sunlight driven. And then, you know, the nutrients that we're eating, uh, many of these are going to provide energy for our body. And then anytime we make energy in the body, one of the byproducts of that is heat. So here's the interesting thing. People who don't uh, make enough energy and they're super duper tired are usually also very cold. So like it could be super hot out and they're wearing a sweater outside because they don't produce enough energy, they don't produce enough heat. You'll see this especially like in your geriatric patients. <laughs> okay, so you have these geriatric patients who are much older and they've lost a lot of muscle mass. And how this equates is the cells that make the most energy for our body are muscle cells. So if I don't have a lot of muscle mass, I can't produce a lot of energy. And if I can't produce a lot of energy, I don't produce a lot of heat. So you might have this 90-year-old geriatric female patient who has to wear a thick sweater wherever she goes, even though it's 105 degrees outside because she's so cold internally because she can't produce the energy we need. And you should know probably by now that the energy we're producing, we call ATP, which stands for adenosine triphosphate. That's our major energy source in the body. Now, we're going to make ATP, and we're going to talk about this over the next couple of weeks. But in order to make this energy source, we have three major types of nutrient groups that we can turn into energy. Okay? So we have carbohydrates, we have fats, and we have proteins. Now, our body does not want to use protein as an energy source unless it absolutely has to. Because our body, the protein in it, uh, is really necessary. So we're talking about connective tissue, we're talking about your hair, muscles including cardiac muscle, skeletal muscle, muscle for your uh, gastrointestinal system, which is smooth muscle. These are things we would have to break down and break apart in order to produce energy. And the body's like, eh, don't really want to have to do that would prefer to use carbohydrates and fats as a major energy source and only if we're in a starvation mode are we going to turn to proteins. Now this is where you're going to see people in the United States mainly burning too many proteins when they're on those diets where they're eating less than a thousand calories a day. And that for them is going to become a real issue because usually you can't keep that up for very long because the body will drive you like crazy to stop eating on a starvation diet when there's food in front of you. It's going to tell you, no, 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 go eat, go eat, go eat. So they can stay on that diet for a while, but then they get off the diet and they need to eat. Well, during that diet, because they were eating so little carbs and fat, the body started breaking down protein and it breaks down muscle. Now, let's go back. Muscle is where most of your energy is made. 
And now, if this person has very little muscle, they have very little energy. And they have very little energy because they can't break down fat, they can't break down carbohydrates very well. And so, even though they're eating them, the body will now store them away. And anytime I can't break down carbohydrates or fat, because I don't have enough muscle, and I can't break these down, both of these will be stored in my body as fat. So a person who's on a starvation diet, once they get off that diet because they have so little muscle mass, they will get fatter than they were before. And the only way to get over that is they have to weight lift. And most of these are women on the starvation diet, and now they don't have enough muscle mass, and they don't have very much energy, and to try to get them to weight lift, yeah. not going to happen. Mm -hmm. It's just it's not going to happen. But they're in a big, uh, they're in a big do loop. They're in a big problem because they've lost so much muscle, and they're going to get fatter and fatter, and they'll try to starve themselves again because they get into that habit of, well, this is the easy way to get out, which, by the way, is a really good way to get yourself into a bad, bad behavioral problem. So when we are receiving energy from our nutrients, this energy in the food is measured in what we call kilocalories, okay? So that's different from the calories on the package. So let's say that you buy a yogurt and this yogurt has 120 calories in it, okay? In actuality, that yogurt has 120,000 calories because when we say calories on a package, we really mean kilocalories, but it kind of would freak people out if we said that that yogurt had 120,000 calories on it. So we just take the thousand off and say it's 120 <coughs> calories. But really, our calories are measured as kilocalories, okay? So when we talk about kilocalories, all right, then this isn't any big deal. You don't really have to know this, but to figure out it, what a kilocalorie is, how they do this is they figure out the amount of energy needed to raise the temperature of one kilogram of water, one degree Celsius. And that's the definition of what a kilocalorie is, okay? Uh, not that we care about this, but when they try to figure out how many calories food has, they actually burn the food and they measure in what's called a calorimeter, they measure the amount of energy coming off of that burned food to figure out the total calories from it. Now, uh, we've already talked about this, so I'm just going to skip through real fast. So one kilocalorie is a thousand calories. And again, that's not the same as what's on our nutrition label. But I want you to know that carbohydrates and proteins provide four kilocalories of energy per gram. Fat gives us much more energy per gram, two and a half times more than carbohydrates and, and proteins. Fat is nine kilocalories per gram, okay? So carbs and proteins are four. Fat is nine kilocalories per gram. So let's do a little calculation. Uh, you decide to eat a bag of potato chips and drink 16 ounces of Coke for an afternoon snack. The two items contain 144 grams of carbohydrates, 12 grams of protein, and 60 grams of fat. How many kilocalories did you consume? And what percentage of those total kilocalories are carbohydrates, proteins, and fat? So what percentage of carbs, proteins, and fats does your snack contain? Go, see if you can figure it out. Use those numbers I just gave you, the 4 kilocalories per gram and the 9 kilocalories per gram. And see if you can find the total kilocalories and then the percentages of the carbs, the fats, and the proteins.
Percentages. So you take four times one forty four. What's that? Five hundred what? Five hundred and seventy six. And then you divide that by one thousand one hundred and sixty four. And then multiply this by one hundred, and that will give you your percent of carbohydrates. And then do the same thing. Take your 48 divided by 1,164 times 100. That's your percent of protein. And then you do the same thing for fat. So what's the percent of carbs? 49%. 49%? And the percent of protein? Four percent. And the percent of fat? Forty-four? Forty-six. Forty-six? That doesn't come out to a hundred. It's like forty-nine point four eight four point Okay, so we'll just round this off and we'll say fifty. Now we come out to hundred. That makes me happy. <laughs> okay, but you get the idea. So you're just going to take your grams of carbs, multiply by four, take your grams of protein, multiply by four, take your grams of fat, multiply by nine, and get the total. And then take each of these separate ones and, and divide by your total times 100. And that gives you your percentage of each of these in whatever the food is that the person is eating. Okay, pretty simple. We're going to do some calculations. You'll probably like C1 in October around that first exam, so remember these numbers. All right, so we're going to talk about carbs next week in this class. And carbs, we'll talk about, again, uh, simple and complex, and the fact that they're composed mainly of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Very good for our body because we're made mostly of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And then we're also going to talk about lipids. And lipids are basically fats. And when we eat fats, we're eating uh, what are called triglycerides. We eat oily types of substances, which are part of the triglycerides. We eat phospholipids. And then we are going to talk about like steroid hormones. Uh, and then these also contain a lot of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, so very good for the body. But they contain a little bit less oxygen than carbohydrates. And so we'll talk about those the week after next. And then after that, we're going to go through proteins and how we use proteins as building blocks and not a primary energy source. However, they have a lot to do with enzymes. And you remember that enzymes catalyze reactions. What does catalyze mean? Speed them up. Very good. Okay. Vitamins. Uh, these are important because uh, although they don't provide energy, they are what we would call coenzymes. And some of our enzymes cannot do their job unless a vitamin of some kind is attached to them. Uh, and especially the B vitamins, they're really big at helping enzymes do their job. Uh, there are 13 known vitamins that we need for the human body. And they're classified based on how well they dissolve, or what they dissolve in, I should say. 
Uh, nine are what we call water soluble because they dissolve in water, obviously. And those would be like our B vitamins and then vitamin C. And we're going to go all over these as we go through the lectures. And then we also have four fat soluble vitamins because they dissolve well in fat. And uh, those would be A, D, E, and K. We're also going to talk about minerals and what we need for our body. There are in, these are inorganic substances, uh, but they're very important in helping in different things like, for instance, helping uh, in red blood cells. We have major minerals and minor or trace minerals. Uh, we call them major minerals because our body needs more of them on a daily basis. So we need over 100 milligrams per day in the body, whereas trace minerals you need less than 100 milligrams per day and you don't keep very much of them in the body. So we'll go over major and minor or trace minerals. Uh, we're not... <coughs> Well, I'm going to talk about genetically modified a little bit in this class, uh, and we're actually going to uh, look at some case studies about genetically modified and what this means to our nutrition. Um, and these are what are typically referred to as functional foods. So functional foods are where somebody has changed these foods by either modifying the genetics of the food or they put additives into the food. So maybe they'll add what we call fortify the food. So you've probably seen things fortified with vitamin B, okay? Uh, all of your bread is fortified with vitamin B. And that's not necessarily a good thing because over 50% of you in here probably don't even realize that you can't convert the type of vitamin B they put in bread and uh, you need a totally different type of vitamin B and you probably shouldn't be eating fortified bread. So we'll talk about what the heck that all means as well and all these functional foods. Uh, how can you use diet to improve your health? Well, we'll talk about this, but the really interesting thing is the Human Genome Project. The Human Genome Project uh, has looked at how nutrition and genetics go hand in hand and what we can do to help somebody nutrition-wise if we know their genetic background. And so many people are doing like this 23andMe type of testing and they are understanding more of their nutrition based on the genetics of that individual. And so this has been really interesting being able to help people after you look at their genetic profile and see what their genetic profile says about them because it tells you uh, if somebody needs more of a certain type of vitamin or more of a certain type of mineral, there's certain genetics that help us to understand how the body behaves uh, when it comes to certain classes of nutrition. For instance, there has been uh, research done on what's called gene expression. Now this is really interesting stuff. And there's a totally new term for this uh, that 10 years ago we didn't even know about. This is something called epigenetics. So if you think about it, it makes perfect sense, although again, nobody really understood this until recently. But the cells in your liver have the exact same DNA as the cells of your skin. Okay? But then why is it do the cells of your skin make skin and the cells of your liver do all the things that the liver does? And the cells of your skin uh, help to produce the different things that make hair, but there's no hair on your liver. So, bottom line is, although every single cell in your body has the same DNA, parts of that DNA are inactive in some cells and active in others. So how is it that some parts of your DNA are turned off and some parts of your DNA are turned on depending on the cell? And even more than that, also depending on your age. Like for instance, 
Y'all are young enough to not really have to worry about L'Oreal in your hair, but when you start getting a little more mature, like mom, you invest a little bit more in that L'Oreal, okay? Why? Because your hair starts to turn gray, right? And why is that happening? Well, as we get older, something occurs, magic, that actually turns off part of our DNA and we can't produce color for our hair anymore. Now, here's the interesting thing. They're trying to figure out what part of the DNA actually controls the color of your hair. And could you eat certain foods that turn that DNA back on? So, bye-bye L'Oreal. You wouldn't need it anymore because your hair would always stay that particular color. So what they found is there are certain foods that you can eat that will actually keep on parts of your DNA that help us with longevity and health. <coughs> Most of those foods that keep parts of your DNA on are called methylated foods. So where in the world do you get methylated foods that keep you living the healthiest, the longest, and we're going to talk about this more as we go along, but methylated foods, oh, you're probably not going to like this, um, they're in your veggies, so the more veggies you eat, the better off you are. Uh, they are not in processed foods. When they process the foods, the methylation goes bye-bye. So the more raw the form, the better it's methylated. So your carrot that's raw is a better methylated carrot than a carrot you cook. And you've probably heard of like the raw diet. That's how this diet sprang out. They eat everything raw, and I mean everything, okay? Their eggs are raw, their meat is raw, everything is raw. I'm not necessarily saying that that's good. I am not on a raw diet, okay? I like <laughs> cooked stuff. Uh, but this is where they got the idea that the more raw it is, even your meats, your eggs, the greater potential for methylation, the longer your life. And that methylation seems to keep the immune system more healthy. Yeah, I know. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> I don't like it. If you're on a raw diet, I'm sorry, but I just, I could not do that. Uh, but it also helps to keep the immune system healthy. Uh, and here's another thing. The more methylated your diet, the thinner you will be. Which, of course, duh. Okay. <laughs> I'm talking about you eat those healthy foods that are not the processed McDonald's and microwave and all that stuff. And it's kind of like, we sort of already know that. Those are the things we're supposed to be eating. Not necessarily that we will, but that's really what we're supposed to be doing. <laughs> I really like that picture. That's why I put it in here. Uh, how healthy is the average American? Well, mm, not. Okay, we're not doing real good in those health things, even if we may not be obese. We have a very uh, high population of skinny, unhealthy people, okay? Because they may be thin, but they're not necessarily keeping themselves healthy nutrition-wise. They're neglecting the proper foods. Uh, we tend to have too much sugar, too much sodium, not enough vitamins, not enough fiber uh, in our diet, and we're eating out a lot. Okay, that's another really big deal, which, of course, we've already said, usually consume more food. Uh, and then we skip breakfast, okay? We're a big country of not eating breakfast. Even though we know breakfast is super important for us, we usually don't like to actually eat it. <laughs> okay, so there's uh, three different ways that research is done uh, for nutrition, and I just want you to know these words. So uh, there's observational research, epidemiological research, experimental research. So observational research, this is 
uh, talking to people, talking to groups of people, and trying to determine their nutrition and their certain health outcomes. You're not actually doing any research on them. You're just watching them, evaluating them, collecting data, but you're not changing their diet. Uh, you're not trying anything different. Epidemiological research uh, involves looking at an entire population of people, okay, and examining their health outcomes. So maybe you're looking at uh, a certain population. So maybe you're looking at, uh, you know, Asian population, or maybe you're looking at a population of just a certain town. It doesn't matter what the uh, origins of those people are. They just all live in this certain community, and there's something going on in that community. Uh, so, for instance, um, uh, you probably know there is a town down the hill in the Inland Empire called Rialto, okay? And in that town, there is an inordinate amount of obese individuals, more than any other place in the United States. And when they started looking at this population of people who lived in Rialto, uh, they also found out that there is a huge number of people in that town who have hypothyroidism. So now is it because the people who live there don't know how to eat right? Is there something going on in this town? What's different about this town? So they started looking at this population doing this epidemiological research. And what they found was that in the 1950s there was a bomb making factory in Rialto. And that factory dumped all of its chemical waste into the water supply. And if you live in the city of Rialto, there is a massively high quantity of these chemicals to this day in that water. And we lived in Rialto while that study was being done. And uh, it's very interesting because even my dogs ended up with hypothyroidism. Uh, that there has been a huge lawsuit and it was taken all the way to the Supreme Court because the city of Rialto refused to even try to clean up this mess and the Supreme Court said they don't have to. So if any of your loved ones live in that city, you might want to let them know about this study. It's a very interesting study. Uh, experimental research is where you are actually doing some kind of experiment on a group of individuals. Maybe you take a group of individuals and you ask them to all eat bananas for breakfast, lunch, and dinner for the next 20 days and compare them to people who don't eat bananas for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So you're doing some kind of experiment. Usually, hopefully, the research is done on animals before it's actually transferred to people, but that's not always the case. Sometimes we just like to research on people. Uh, and then there's something called a placebo versus a double-blind study. So the word placebo is, I don't tell you if you are in the research group or if you are in the control group, okay? So maybe I've added a chemical to certain foods, and I want to see if this chemical causes cancer. And so I take this group of people, and I have them eat this food with the chemical in it, and I have another group of people that is my control group, and they don't eat the chemical in the food. And I'm going to wait to see if my research group gets cancer from this. But I don't tell the people which group they're in. Okay? And you think that's bad. You think that's an extreme example. But we actually have these types of research where you have people who have cancer, and they go into a research project, and they are given a chemical that's supposed to cure the research. Or are they? Because your loved one could go into this research project and they could be receiving what we call the placebo. Because we don't tell the cancer patient if they're actually getting the chemical or if they're not. So placebo means that they're not actually getting that chemical. They're not really part of the research group. They're just what we would call the control group. Uh, a double-blind study would also mean that when we put people into two different groups, and let's say we give this group the chemical that may cause cancer, the researcher themselves don't know who gets the cancer-causing drug and who doesn't. 
they don't know who's part of the group either. And we call that a double blind study because the researcher doesn't know and the participant doesn't know. They're both blind to what's going on. So we already basically talked about this. Uh, I just want to go over this too. There is what's called a prospective study and a retrospective study or what's called a case controlled study. So a prospective study may show an effect between food and a disease. Okay, And so you collect food intake uh, from the person and you know about their food before before they ever get a disease. Now, that's kind of hard to do, but let me tell you about Framingham, Massachusetts. This is a freaky town because this town has been a guinea pig town for the last 50 years. If you move to Framingham, Massachusetts, you have to sign a contract that says, I will be part of any study that goes on in this town. So they have done studies on cardiovascular disease in this town. They've done studies on menopause in this town. They've done all kinds of studies. So you move to Framingham, maybe your parents take you there, you're five years old, and they start collecting data on you immediately. You have to go every couple of months and they take your blood pressure, they take your height, they take your weight, they look at you, they figure out what study are we going to put you in. So this is a prospective study. They take this five-year-old and they think, oh, well, I want to know about nutrition. But I'm not going to do anything except collect data on this child until this child grows up. I'm going to look at what this child eats for breakfast, lunch, and dinner until they grow up and maybe at the age of 40 they get cardiovascular disease. And then I'm going to go back and look to see what they ate all this time or how much exercise they had and see if there's a correlation between the disease and what they did growing up. That's a prospective study. That's a huge study. And some of these big studies where you hear about cardiovascular disease or how estrogen affects women in menopause and all, this is all coming from Framingham, Massachusetts. These people have been giving us data for forever on their lives. It's really amazing uh, how this study occurs. These retrospective studies are instead of following the person from healthy to sick, now your patient comes in and they are sick. You go back and try to look at their life and try to see if there's a correlation as best as you can between the way they live their life and their diet and that type of thing. Retrospective studies are a little bit more difficult to do, but those are the ones we do most often because every city is in Framingham, Massachusetts, okay? Yeah. So we can't actually follow everybody. That would be great if we could, but it's just not something we're able to do.